Hello, thank you for joining the Home and Community-Based Settings Rules Provider Training Session 1, the HCBS Overview. I'm Danielle Ashlock. I'm the Alltech Project Manager here at Access, and I'm joined by my colleague, Sarah Johnson, the Program Officer for Access. Um, we would like to level set and let you know that this is a re-recording of the first session as we had some technical difficulties. So we are um, going to integrate some of the Q&A that we received during that first session throughout this uh, re-recording as we go through the rules. Um, on to the agenda. So hi, this is Sarah Johnson from Access regarding our agenda for today. So we're certainly going to, Danielle's going to go over uh, each of the different rules um, as it relates to um, residential day programs and employment programs and really talk about what these rules mean in practice um, and trying to help you all in thinking about how to operationalize these rules. We'll also talk about person-centered planning because as we talk and go through the, each of the different rules, you might be thinking, wow, it's um, unsafe or uh, may impact a person's health um, to have access to some of these rules depending upon the unique support needs of the individual. So we'll talk about the role of the person-centered plan. Um, Danielle will also cover um, quality monitoring. So how do we plan to monitor provider compliance with these rules? Um, go over the heightened scrutiny process um, a little bit, which is that process that CMS created or Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, uh, otherwise known as CMS, created um, for those settings that uh, meet certain criteria and we want those settings to continue to be able to operate. So there is a level, uh, a little level extra of monitoring and oversight by CMS for those particular settings. So we'll talk about that. We'll talk about other setting types that have to comply with the rules that aren't just your traditional um, setting types that Danielle will review in just a minute. So they may not, they're not licensed settings, but settings that otherwise would need to comply with the rules go over what support we're going to be offering all of you as you prepare to comply in your individual provider's uh, service settings, and then talk about um, some upcoming opportunities to help incentivize your participation and compliance through the differential adjusted payment. So the intent of the HCBS rules. So the real purpose, of course, is to enhance the quality of home and community-based services, provide protections to participants to make sure that they can fully participate in their programs, but more importantly, that their programs are supporting them to have access to the full benefits of community living. So this means receiving services in the most integrated setting, of which, of course, our program has done um, uh, to the testament of the work that you all have been doing. We are able to serve people in the most integrated setting and even people with significant needs. Um, but our opportunity here, and Danielle will kind of cover this more in detail, is that the goal is to ensure that people are receiving services to the same degree of accesses um, to their communities, individuals not receiving HCBS. So something that we are going to talk about time and time again about what's culturally normative for individuals in their peer group, their um, age group, um, and peers um, in the community who don't have disabilities or, or don't have physical health conditions, what are those individuals doing in their community and how can we ensure that our, the members that we serve are accessing um, services and activities and engaging in their community to the same degree as anyone else who may not be a Medicaid member. So this is a really big culture shift. Um, when we look at these rules, we look at them as rights afforded to members. And we don't, we, the way we're approaching this is that they don't have to be earned. They automatically get them and then based upon health and safety restrictions or health and safety concerns, um, demonstrated concerns, those uh, rules or rights can be restricted um, to, of course, protect health and safety. So um, it's really important that we look at these um, um, as not something that has to be earned, but they automatically get, which is a shift for us as well as we need to make sure that the services supports and any of those health and safety restrictions are individualized versus apply to a group as a whole, um, whether that be a group in a program or a group home, um, we wanna make sure that the restrictions are individualized and specific to that individual. 
So settings that are not home and community-based and do not have to worry about complying with the HCBS rules, um, those are your nursing facilities, institutions for mental disease, intermediate care facilities for individuals with intellectual disabilities, hospitals, or any other locations that have the quality of an institutional setting as determined by the secretary. The settings that do have to comply are HCBS residential settings. Those are assisted living facilities, assisted living homes, uh, centers, adult foster care, DD group homes, DD adult and child developmental homes, uh, for non-residential settings, adult day health, DDD day treatment and training programs, DDD center-based employment programs, which uh, we'll talk about a little bit later, but we'll be transitioning to a pre-vocational service, and DDD group um, supported employment programs. All of these settings must be um, compliant by March of 2022. So as part of this culture shift, we thought we would have um, a good opportunity for maybe a branding effort around the HCBS rules. We also wanted to get away from calling them rules because um, it can have a negative connotation. And these really are the new standard of care for our members. These are the rights that they're afforded. Um, and, and this will be the way that they receive services from here on out. So we thought, um, with some work from our HCBS steering committee and work groups, we all put our heads together to come up with, um, we thought a brand that really summarized the rights that members will get through the HCBS rules. And what we came up with was equality through choice. Um, you can see our logo here. Eventually it'll be updated on our um, HCBS website and you'll start seeing it on some of the communications that we put together for members and providers. And we really wanted to focus on the choices that members are afforded through the HCBS rules and make sure that we are supporting members to live their life like anyone else, um, which is that equality component. Um, it's, it's really the crux of the HCBS rules, just making sure that our members have a normative life as anyone else does. Um, that is our branding campaign. The HCBS rules do give us some new opportunities um, because they are a new standard set of basic rights that will be afforded to all of our members. As Dara said, these rights don't have to be earned. The members just get these rights from now on. It reinforces our priority of already serving members in the least restrictive setting. And it gives us a new priority to make sure that members are actively engaged and participating in their communities in the way that they see fit. So we will jump into the actual rules now. Um, we're gonna go through kind of rule by rule and how it would look in some of these different settings. Um, I have also taken snippets from the actual provider self-assessment that you will, that providers will start doing as part of the, um, their annual compliance monitoring. Um, so we've just tried to incorporate a little bit of everything to give you a real feel of how these rules will actually be applied in, in, in reality. <laughs> and ultimately setting the expectation for what providers, what you all will need to do from a provider perspective to comply with the rules. And Danielle, I think it is important that we highlight for everyone that everybody has a responsibility in this. Access has a responsibility. The health plans, which are um, include DDD and also our health plans for the elderly and physically disabled part of our program, the EPD program, um, everybody has a responsibility, so given this is a provider training, we're talking largely about what the provider responsibility is relative to compliance with these rules. Thank you, Dara. So we'll move into rule one. The setting is integrated in and supports school access to the greater community, including opportunities to seek employment and work in competitive integrated settings, engage in community life, control personal resources, and receive services in the community to the same degree of access as people not receiving Medicaid services. So for employment um, supports in a residential setting, um, some of the questions we have in the provider uh, self-assessment is does the setting engage individuals of working or school age to see if they're interested in work or school? And when individuals express an interest in employment, does the setting refer them for employment services or schooling? 
um, it's really important to note we don't expect residential settings to um, now incorporate employment programs into their setting. It's more important that you support the member, that you listen to their needs and goals, and that you refer them for those supports out in the community or, or however that looks for um, employment services or schooling. So not, not really directly on the provider to, to make this happen, but just to make sure that you're supporting the member and helping them find those supports that they need so that they can become employed. Um, and one other question is, do individuals have access to transportation to and, for, um, to and from work or volunteering activities? Again, not solely on the provider to make sure that members um, are taken to work back and forth, but helping uh, members find those supports. So whether or not that's the coworker that comes and takes them or uh, transportation training, there are different avenues out there that will meet different members' needs. So just making sure you're working with the member to find out how they can best be supported with transportation to work. For day program, uh, some of the questions we have on the self-assessment is does the program support individuals to have support to learn new skills or instruction for skill development? And does the program support individuals to have career exploration opportunities? Um, so a lot of individuals need, well, a lot of members might need support with learning skills that could include resume writing or just, you know, how to follow rules and, and or follow steps. Um, there, there could be a lot of different things that incorporate this, and I think a lot of programs already do this. Um, and as far as career exploration, members may not have any idea what kind of work is available to them or, or what they're capable of if they're not exposed to it. I think too, Danielle, the career expression really hard, helps with just interest in various types of work that are out there um, or even volunteer opportunities. One of the things that is important to highlight is when CMS talks about employment, they talk about paid or unpaid employment. Um, so certainly individuals could volunteer as part of a day program activity, either as a group or as an individual. And also when we talk about new skill development, there could be things like things that you guys are probably doing already, soft skills around hygiene or soft skills around just learning how to um, engage in conversation with other people or all those things that could be built up to support whether it's volunteer or paid employment in the future. So in the actual um, employment programs, some of the questions we have is do individuals have career exploration opportunities again? Uh, and do individuals either employed or preparing for employment have job tasks that a non-disabled peer would perform for pay? So just are they, um, do they have the opportunity to complete a job that anyone else can do for pay? Um, Again, I think that's just kind of looking at what's normative, right? If somebody is getting paid to um, assemble items or to um, perform a function uh, at an offsite, um, off facility based environment are those jobs that and not an individual who doesn't have a disability would get paid to do understanding sometimes people are doing tasks of a particular job um, or job carving which is certainly appropriate but ultimately are they contributing a task that somebody else would do who doesn't have a disability again looking at what's a normative work environment and normative actual work Um, so we'll move on to the community life portion of rule one, um, which is just engaging in community life. Some of the questions we have around this are, uh, do individuals have staff support to assist them in participating in activities in the community, um, like personal care assistance? Do individuals have regular opportunities for contact with people who don't live in the home and are not receiving services? Um, this could be people that come in to participate in activities or um, come in to I, I don't know, sing or, or uh, read stories or, or just any kind of involvement that people that don't live there would come in to your setting and provide? Or are your members going out into the community um, regularly? And do individuals participate in activities in integrated settings, uh, religious, social, cultural, or recreational, comparable to their peers? So similar to what Dara was saying earlier, um, it's really important that members are participating in their community in a normative 
way. Um, so, you know, do we have elderly members sitting together and coloring and coloring books, or are they doing what other members in the community would do, which could be going bowling, going out to a movie, going to a community center. Um, we just wanna make sure that our members are able to participate in the type of activities that peers their age are would normally do in that community. And it may, it's gonna look different depending on the community, of course. So not an easy black and white answer for any of these, but just think about where your settings located in that community, especially if you're rural, what do those people in the community do for activities and how can your members start engaging in those same activities? So Danielle, it's probably good to also highlight in, in the, um, when we did the live session, there was a lot of questions about staffing and how providers can accommodate via, they have certain staffing ratios that, um, that you all have that are tied to your rates and the rates that you're paid for services and understanding that um, if somebody in, has an individual idea of where they want to go um, and participate, um, what, you know, uh, agencies may have staffing challenges to accommodate that need and request, as well as um, maybe some of the staffing ratios might disincentivize people to support members to be out in the community because maybe there's less staff that are needed if folks are out in the community with informal support and then um, that reduces the amount of pay that they receive. So um, just want everyone to be aware that we're aware of those things. And as part of the transition plan process, um, um, once we kind of start with the quality monitoring reviews and get through the provider training, our next step is to look at policy and contracts and what um, part of contractual arrangements need to be evaluated so that providers are in uh, incentivized, meaning there isn't anything that would um, uh, create a disincentive for you to support these activities. So while CMS didn't give us additional funding um, for the HCBS rules, we need to think creatively within the construct that we have now and the funds that we have available now to think about how we can support um, providers and complying with these initiatives, and that's part of our overall planning, which we will engage in our next phase. Um, so community, community life for day programs. Um, some of the questions we ask around this are, do individuals interact with the general public through visitation to the program or activities in the general community? So kind of that same thing, people coming into the program, um, you know, participating in, in activities or maybe helping with that career exploration, um, just providing a service or the members going out into the general community. Are individuals learning and engaging in activities in the community comparable to their peers? That's gonna be a big thing and it's part of that whole normative, are our members living a normative life and doing things that are normal to their peer group? And do individuals have staff support to assist them in participating in activities in the community like personal care assistance? Community life for the employment programs looks a little bit different. Um, so do working individuals interact with members of the community? I, um, for example, providing training to prepare for work or customers purchasing goods. Um, do individuals either employed or preparing for employment routinely interact with the general public through visitation to the program and or activities in the general community? So again, that could be people coming into the employment program to provide training or skill development or those members going out to the community um, maybe selling their products at a farmer's market or, or something along those lines to interact with the um, community. Personal resources, um, for residential and non-residential, it's, it's pretty similar. Um, basically, do individuals have control of their personal resources? Do they have someone to assist them in managing their funds if they need? Do they decide how to spend their money? Do they have access to the community to purchase goods and services? And for um, employment, is pay for work rendered directly to the individual or their representative? And are individuals either employed or preparing for employment provided with information about how their benefits are affected by employment income? Um, and, and that could be the setting referring that member to um, uh, 
Disability Benefits 101 course, um, you know, not again, not necessarily the provider having to provide it, but just making sure that members have access to that information um, and, and can find those trainings if they need them. So Danielle, in the live session that we had, there were a lot of questions around um, it's good and well that we want people to be out in their community and engaging and doing activities, but oftentimes those things require funding to do that. Um, so um, some of the suggestions that were brought forward or questions that were brought forward are around when people living in a setting where there's room and board costs, like a group home or assisted living, looking at increasing um, or considerations for increasing the personal needs allowance to accommodate um, some of their activities in the community, which ultimately would reduce potentially their contribution to the room and board payment. I will tell you this is something that is on our agenda to continue discussing, particularly if we're supporting people to go to work and then they go to work and all of their money goes to their room and board payment versus increasing their personal needs allowance so they can actually spend money based upon their hard earned they can spend their hard-earned money. So um, those are great questions, and those are things that um, we are actively considering to um, have those conversations, again, to support um, these integration efforts. Thank you, Dara. So services in the community uh, for residential. We want to make sure people are receiving services in the community to the same degree um, as people who don't receive Medicaid. Some of the questions we asked around this in the self-assessment are, um, are members given the choice and opportunity to freely exit the facility, free from a curfew or other requirements for a scheduled return home? Um, I know that can sound scary. You have to um, keep in mind with these self-assessments, we're asking about your setting as a whole and not based on individual needs. So as you um, go through this process and you complete your self-assessments, you'll want to have that that uh, focus that this is for a member who would have no health, safety, or guardian risks or issues. Um, and, and we would expect that those members are given the choice and opportunity to, to freely leave and, and go into the community as they need to. Are individuals given the choice and opportunity to freely come and go from the setting? Do individuals have access to transportation to and from the setting for those purposes of engaging in community life? And again, not not solely on the provider. If someone wants to go to church, is there a church member that can come pick them up and take them to services? Um, if someone wants to go see a concert, they have friends and families that can help them get there. Um, there's lots of um, informal support um, that we would just ask that you support the member in finding so they can participate in the community in the way that they see fit. So Danielle, some of the original questions in the live session also to um, relate heavily on this area about the provider's liability um, in providing services to the member, but if they go out with an informal support um, or they go on their own, um, what's the liability on the provider? Um, so I think those are questions that have been raised previously that we're kind of working on through the work group process particularly if you're in an assisted living facility. Um, we have had some initial discussions with licensure about their take on that liability and risk, and we'll be inviting them to a future work group meeting to have the discussion. Um, but I think those are valid questions, and I think those are some things that we'll be issuing further guidance on in the future. So I definitely appreciate you thinking about that. Um, and um, helping us think through some of those critical questions that we need to address. Thank you, Dara. And since Dara brought up licensure, I think it's a good point to, to remind you that these requirements are, are above and, and beyond your licensure requirements. Right, they don't replace what you currently have to do if you're um, a assisted living facility, which is really the only facility that we're talking about in this context that has licensure from ADHS, the other settings have licensure from DDD, um, but the ADHS license settings, you will still continue to get your regular visits from ADHS and your licensing requirements remain the same. As Danielle said, this is over and above what is required of you and certainly complementary to what's already required of you um, to ensure you have a license from Department of Health Services. Um, so services in the community for a day program, it looks a little bit different. 
Can individuals engage in activities that are specific to their skills, abilities, desires, needs, and preferences, including engaging um, in activities with people of their own choosing and in areas of their own choosing? Um, this could be just, you know, at the setting with their group of friends. Can they go complete a puzzle or, or do a game outside? Um, in the yard, or do they have to be confined inside? That that would, um, you know, be something to consider in giving your members choice. Are individuals given the choice and opportunity to freely come and go from the setting? And again, do individuals have access, um, access to transportation, provider related or otherwise, to and from the setting for those purposes of engaging in community life? For employment, this is gonna look a little different again. Do individuals have the ability to request alternative working schedules consistent with customary employment practices? Um, so I know in, in my job, if I need to flex a day for an appointment or, or work um, an early schedule or work later, th those are things I can talk to my boss about and we can come to some type of agreement. So we would expect that our members would have that same flexibility. And it doesn't mean that every request is granted, but just that there can be a conversation and, and just as, as we all have in our workplaces. And do individuals have benefits to the same extent of individuals not receiving Medicaid funded services, including negotiating work schedules, breaks and lunch, um, and if applicable vacation, medical leave or medical benefits. So um, just like in your work environment, uh, we we expect that our members who are working would be able to have a break, would be able to have lunch, um, you know, and, and just those normative things that are needed for working any job. Do individuals have informal support to assist them in participating in employment related activities in the community? So when these members maybe go out to sell goods at a farmer's market, do they have that personal assistance if they need it? Um, and do individuals have access again to transportation, provider related or otherwise, to and from work? So Danielle, another example of an informal support, it could be, um, if, if, if all of us thought about our work environment today, we all have informal supports in our work environment. There are people that I know in my office today, if I'm, ha if I'm struggling or I'm upset about something that I can go to and just talk to. And so some of that is promoting this idea of of really trying to help our members create those supportive environments, just like you or I have in, within their workspace, just like um, we do. Uh, we do it a little bit more naturally, so we're hoping that um, employment providers can assist in this, in this uh, vein as well. So we're moving on to rule two now. <laughs> The setting is selected by the individual from among setting options, including non-disability specific settings and an option for a private unit in a residential setting. This one's a little easier. Um, so this applies to all settings. And we're just asking, does the setting allow individuals to visit the setting prior to choosing to live there or attend a program there? Um, so this could be sharing a meal, participating in an activity, just something that would let the member um, interact with the with the current members there and see if they're a good fit, if that's something that they want to do, if it's something important to them. Rule three is around the person-centered plan. Um, the setting options are identified and documented in the person-centered service plan and are based off the individual's needs, preferences, and for residential settings, resources available for room and board. So we have some questions in the um, provider self-assessment around the person-centered service plan. I will give you the caveat that the person-centered service plan won't actually be implemented until June of this year. Um, so it may not be something you immediately see, but you gradually throughout the year, you will start seeing these person-centered service plan meetings take place. And as a provider, um, our hope is that you would participate in them um, especially as you're um, completing your setting specific service plan. So some of these questions on the assessment include, does the setting provide support so that the individual can participate in the person-centered service plan meetings? So um, this could look really different depending on the individual's needs, but we'll just give an example that if the meeting is 
scheduled during that person's lunch, can you work with that member to either have lunch before or after so that they can attend this very important meeting? Um, something simple like that. Does the setting participate in the person-centered service plan meetings? Again, these are really um, focused on the member, figuring out what their needs are. This is your chance to work with that person-centered team so that the um, burden is not all on you as a provider, but you guys can work together to find some of these supports for the member. So we would expect that you participate. And does the setting provide updates on the individual's progress and or significant changes that impact their goals and care? Um, especially for you know residential settings where the member is living with you as the provider, we would expect that you're um, paying attention to the member's needs and their progress and that you can report that to the person center planning team so that if there's any um, resolution, um, problems, whatever, the team together can come up with a solution with the member. And does the facility plan align with the person-centered service plan? So again, that would be why you would participate is to make sure that as you're doing your uh, setting plan, that it, that it would align and, um, and take place at the same time as those person-centered service plan meetings. So really that last point is really specific to the assisted living facilities and the adult day health day program settings where a requirement of licensure is that they have their own plan of care essentially. So um, for DD settings, the person center plan is the plan of care for all services. Um, so we just want to make sure that um, again, it aligns and supports and furthers what the member is outlining in their person center plan as to what's important to them and what their needs are. So rule four ensures individual rights of privacy, dignity and respect and freedom from coercion and restraint. For, um, we have these questions again for all the settings in the self-assessments, they might be ordered a little bit different, but they're in there. Um, so in, do individuals receive personal care assistance in private? Do individuals receive information about their rights in plain language? Do individuals know who to contact if they have concerns or complaints? And do they have protections against restrictive measures? Um, I think most of these are in, in place already, so this is just documenting what you're already doing. Um, we are going to provide some support around the individual rights. Um, we're working on some documents that can be shared with members at some point. Um, they, they won't be updated on the website you know, within this month or anything, but it is something we're actively working on and trying to get member involvement and input in some of those communication items. Rule five, optimizes but does not regiment individual initiative, autonomy, and independence in making life choices, including but not limited to daily activities, physical environment, and with whom to interact. So um, autonomy and accessibility for all settings, uh, we would ask these questions. Do individuals get to make informed decisions about what they want to do every day, including scheduling changes? Uh, we know that's scary to hear as a provider. Um, you know, as Sarah was saying, that can involve the staffing ratios. And, and honestly, we don't expect that a home with five members would have a person with each member to help them do five different things that day. Um, that's not what we're expecting of you, but just that members get choice. So let's say, um, you know, I grew up in a, in a rural community. The big thing was to go to Walmart. So let's say the, the setting is going to go to Walmart on Friday night, but one or two members don't want to go. Can we give them the choice to stay home? Can we somehow figure that out? Or if a member has a desire um, to go to the zoo or something, we understand that may not happen tomorrow with your staffing constraints, but can you work with that member to somehow uh, work it into a schedule later on? Um, let's see, the next question, is the setting accessible for people to safely and freely move around the home, including entering and exiting the setting? And I think that's pretty self-explanatory. Rule six. Facilitates individual choice regarding services and supports and who provides them. For all settings, some of the questions you might see on the um, provider self-assessment will be, 
Do individuals have the option to make requests for an alternate staff member to assist them? Again, this is something that we know may not immediately happen, but if your member has a particular staff member they enjoy working with, um, you know, could you work with them to, to somehow later on down the line, make sure that they work more closely together or have more time together? Um, just whatever you're able to accommodate with your staffing restraints. And our request for an alternate staff member honored when the setting can accommodate due to staffing constraints. Can individuals freely make requests for changes in the way their services and supports are delivered? So rule seven is specific to residential settings. Um, in a provider owned or controlled home and community based residential setting, the following additional requirements must be met. The individual has a lease or other legally enforceable agreement providing similar protections. The individual has privacy in their sleeping unit, um, including lockable doors. Um, individual sharing units have a choice of roommates, freedom to furnish or decorate the unit. The freedom, I'm sorry, the individual has the freedom and support to control his or her own schedules and activities, including access to food at any time. And the individuals can have visitors at any time. And again, the setting is physically accessible. So we'll go through and break these down a little bit more. Um, for residential, do individuals have a key to their bedroom or unit, um, which can be a hot topic um, issue for providers? Um, again, keep in mind this is this is barring those health and safety um, issues or, or guardian issues. So this is just a member that should otherwise have access to a key to their bedroom to keep their personal valuables safe and locked up. Um, we're also not saying that staff can't also have a key to that bedroom or unit. Um, just something definitely uh, to consider. I know this is a bigger one and harder to implement, but it is a requirement under the HDBS rules. Are individuals allowed to decorate their own room, including moving furniture and hanging up items on the wall? Um, I, from what I've heard, this is something that really already takes place, so I don't think this is a huge issue. Um, we're just getting this documented to show CMS all the good things you're doing. Do individuals get to choose their roommates? Again, not something we expect to happen tomorrow, um, but if a person does have a roommate preference, you know, we would expect that you work with them to somehow um, make that arrangement as rooms and beds become available. And that would be even particularly, Danielle, when somebody's like a new resident of a, of a facility, whether it be group home or assisted living, um, that if there's two open rooms that they get to maybe meet those folks and talk with them and then decide which one they would prefer to room with, as well as building relationships once they're there and they have maybe a preference for living with a particular person. Thank you. Another fun one, do individuals have access to a key or code to the front door entrance of their home or setting? Um, I think the important thing to keep in mind here, again, barring health and safety issues, these are members who are living in their home. Um, you know, I, I have access to come and go in my home at any time because I don't have health and safety issues. If I did go out and, and you know, there was an issue, we'd have a conversation <laughs> between me and my family members. But right now, I, I have the freedom to do that and we would want our, free, our members to have that same freedom. Um, you know, we just don't want grown adults living in their home to have a curfew. Moving on, do individuals have a choice in what time they want to eat? Um, again, we are not expecting you to serve a hot meal anytime a member decides they want to eat. Um, but maybe if I don't want to eat with everyone else for dinner because maybe I have that person center planning meeting that's going to cut into that time, can I get a sandwich later or a bowl of cereal or some other item that I purchased for myself? Um, would that be an issue? And do individuals have the opportunity to buy their own food, snacks, or drinks? Are individuals free from restrictions like visiting hours on when they can have family and friends over to visit? Another hot button issue with providers. Um, you know, again, this is 
they are adults and these are their homes. Um, you know, it would be rare, but if I needed to have my mother over at my house at 10 o'clock at night, that's totally acceptable. No one's going to stop me from doing that. So do our members have that same freedom? And we understand with this one, um, you know, having visitors over all hours of the night could impede on other members' rights. Um, so we would encourage these members to get together as roommates or as housemates and, and kind of create those housemate rules to make sure that everyone can live together happily, uh, which is very normative. As an adult, I've had roommates and we've had to do that same thing when we've run into issues. The, the difference is we didn't have our landlord take part in those housemate rules, so we wouldn't want the provider to take part either. And do individuals or representatives have, written, have a written agreement in place providing protections to address termination of residency agreement and due process and appeals? For our um, assisted living facilities, this has already taken place uh, through the access residential residency agreement. residency agreement. Thank you, Dara. <laughs> um, this is something we're working on internally with DDD, so, so nothing in place yet. Um, we'll keep you informed on the progress of that should anything change. And so I think as it comes to the self-assessment, this would be something that um, really wouldn't be scored this sort of initial phase. Um, mm -hmm. We wouldn't hold a provider accountable to something that isn't in place yet, but it'll be more of a standard form that everybody will use that all the planning teams will have and board um, payment agreements as well as protections. And this is just to make sure that um, members just that have the same rights of tenancy as they would as if they went and rented an apartment, meaning they couldn't be kicked out without some due process. Um, so in summary, these rules are now the basic rights that are afforded to all of our members. They don't have to be earned. If we need to restrict anything, that would be done to that person-centered planning process, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. And this is not just about the location of where services are provided, but it's really about the individual's experience and outcome and their, their community integration, um, just making sure that they're supported to live the life that they want to live. And as a provider, you're supporting them to get there. And, and as I said earlier, rights might be limited on a case-by-case -case basis if they jeopardize the health and safety of the member and or others. Um, this is going to be documented in that person-centered service plan, and strategies are going to be developed and monitored to restore those rights. And we will talk about that just a little bit later. Actually, right now. <laughs> <laughs> so a little bit about person-centered planning. Um, before we actually go into that process that Danielle alluded to with respect to um, limiting the rights, um, right, because everybody has them. They don't have to earn them. They already have them, but we limit them based upon restrictions. Before we talk about that, just want to highlight, um, maybe Danielle, if you could advance to the next slide. Um, so um, we are working on a, um, a person-centered service planning documentation, uh, a standard documentation um, plan that all support coordinators and case managers will use throughout our long-term care program. And um, we are going to actually be posting that plan very soon for public comment, so we will notify you. Um, what our goal is around the plan is to have a plan that supports documentation of discussions that are heavily revolved around um, the HCBS rules and compliance with the HCBS rules, as well as meeting members' physical needs and healthcare needs. Um, so we'll talk a little bit more in detail about that in a minute. But the reason why I talked about it now is because there's a very standardized process that the, that the form itself will help facilitate a discussion around this. Um, so again, all of these uh, restrictions have to be individualized. Um, they have to be based on identifying a specific assessed need. So we can't say that all individuals with Down syndrome can have a key to their front door um, because of their disability. What's specific about DARA um, not so much about her disability, but what's specific about Dara that has created a risk for this, um, for her to not have a key. Um, so what are the positive interventions and supports that have been used? 
prior to any modifications being applied. Maybe I'm somebody who in the past has handed out my house key to somebody I met at the bus stop because I wanted them to come visit me at my home. So what were documented interventions and supports that were provided to me to learn that that was risky behavior and potentially unsafe behavior? What were those less intrusive methods that, um, were, that my team tried with me to help me learn about that before you actually decide that, oh, we know we actually need to restrict error from having the key to their front door of the group home. Um, so what exactly is it about DARA that needs to be addressed. You can go to the next slide, Danielle. Um, so then, um, what's the plan? Um, so let's try this intervention. We're going to collect data on it. We're going to review it. We're going to review ongoing whether or not the support we're providing to DARA is working so that she can ultimately have that key back. Um, so we're going to establish time limits, periodic reviews. It's not something that goes away entirely forever. Um, and we reassess and we re-engage if there's a new intervention that needs to be applied. And of course, all of this process has to be supported by the individual member and their family or responsible party. And we also need to ensure that whatever interventions are applied don't cause um, harm to the individual. So one of the things um, before we get into the person-centered planning, the standardized process and documentation that came up in previous conversations were, what about if guardians are wanting to restrict these rights versus, um, um, but the team is, is suggesting that no, these rights don't have to be restricted. So there certainly is not a black and white answer to that. I think um, even though someone's under guardianship, the team still needs to work with all of the team members to ensure that members' rights aren't unjustly um, restricted. And so some of that requires um, some conflict resolution at the team level and working with the guardian to um, support these efforts and the members' preferences, regardless of whether or not they have an inability to make health care decisions, they certainly can support their preferences. So there's really not a black and white answer to that question, but a very good one. We are going to be working just as we're doing peer-to-peer -peer training for providers. We are also going to be working with um, families and members to do some peer-to-peer -peer training and education around this um, so we can support people to have the dignity of risk. So in relation to sort of the forms, the standardized forms, and um, the standardized process, um, there is um, a new person-centered planning form which really is sort of to help facilitate a process that supports compliance with the HCBS rules as well as meeting people's um, healthcare needs. So um, there's gonna be discussions around key indicators that help assess the members' uh, in integration experience. The HCBS rules are more about the member experience versus any core hard set of rules or um, environment. It's really about the members' individual integration experience. So, uh, some of the things Danielle's already talked about, um, making choices in their living situation, um, meals and snacks, daily activities, opportunities to interact with the broader community, privacy, um, access to all areas within the home or facility. Um, so, the tool is designed to help facilitate those conversations to identify um, if there are any health and safety risks that necessitate restrictions, and then following those steps as we just went over, um, which we call the risk management plan. And then certainly the person center plan should support personal goal development um, around integration. And so those are the goals that will be in the plan that will help the facility or the program, as well as the planning team to support the member to accomplish those goals. So we've created a standardized form, which I've already pretty much talked about. Um, this form will be used by everyone, case managers and support coordinators of both DDD and the EPD health plans, um, which are Banner, United, and Mercy Care. Um, training is actually occurring right now for case managers and support coordinators, or those individuals that are gonna be, it's really a train the trainer model, they're gonna be training case managers and support coordinators so you should expect to see this being this new plan and this new process being rolled out in June of 2020. And we're going to post it for public comment so you can uh, feel free to share your feedback with us. 
So now we're going to move on to quality monitoring. Um, the whole purpose of what I've been talking about is the provider self-assessment is to make that part of your new annual monitoring cycle. So you already get visits from your health plan um, at least annually to, to assess how you're doing overall. We're just going to incorporate the HCBS rules as part of that to see how compliant you are. Um, so there's a whole tool suite um, that, that goes into this just to validate that self-assessment, um, make sure everyone's on the same page, and um, honestly provides evidence to CMS if we have to for that heightened scrutiny factor. So uh, part of this monitoring tool suite includes member and me member representative interviews. Um, this will be a statistically significant sample of members based on your setting. Um, so for those bigger settings, it won't have to be every single member. Uh, for the smaller settings, it might be every single member. It just depends on how that works out. And those will be something that the health plan facilitates. There's also going to be member file reviews, which is um, part of the normal process that the health plans already complete annually. There will be that um, facility self-assessment, that provider self-assessment you'll be completing before the health plan comes on site. Uh, we'll have that, those uploaded to the website, and there will also be um, a session two training specific to that tool, um, a recorded copy of that training that you can view on the website as well. Uh, another part of the tool suite is observations. Um, so while the health plan is on site, we just have some guidelines for different things. We like them to see if they can observe. Um, we understand that observations are just really specific to what happens that day and that time period they're there, so they may not observe everything, uh, which is why we have all the other tools. Um, they'll also be doing community interviews. So as a provider, you'll actually be giving the health plan a list of two to three people who regularly interact with your setting. Um, that could be people who come in and participate in activities or provide trainings. Um, it could be a friendly mailman that, that likes to spend some time there and talk to everybody. Um, that'll be up to you to decide who, who would be good for those community interviews. Um, and it's just a quick three question interview that the health plan will facilitate. So again, the process is going to be that this is part of your current annual monitoring process now, just moving forward. Um, the health plans are going to prioritize those providers who might need some more um, technical assistance. Um, with these assessment tools, this isn't pass or fail. Uh, we're really just trying to gauge how compliant you are with, with the HCBS rules so that we can figure out what items you might need technical assistance on to become fully compliant by March of 2022, that deadline that CMS gave us. And I think, Danielle, I'd just like to add or stress what you've already said, that um, what's really key is that, that you as providers are very transparent and candid about where your weak areas are, because um, that is more advantageous to you so that you can get the technical assistance you need and support you need to come into compliance. Because if you're found to be not in compliance by um, when March of 2022 hits, you will not be allowed to provide Medicaid funded services. So it's really incumbent upon you to elect to participate in any training, any surveys that are sent out, and then of course, being very candid and transparent during the uh, quality monitoring process about what challenges you have um, so that we don't look at that as a weakness at all. We look at that as a strength so that we as a community of uh, health plans or access or other providers can support you to come into compliance. Our goal is to make sure that you're compliant so that you can continue providing services. Um, and that's uh, very critical and important to us. So that's our overall goal here. Thank you, Dara. Um, as, as part of this um, screening to figure out who, who might need that, that additional technical assistance, we're going to release a really short provider survey soon. Um, it'll just be a little survey monkey thing. It's eight to 10 questions. And it's just going to be questions that um, might be a flag for heightened scrutiny, which we'll talk about right after this. 
um, which is that that second level of um, of scrutiny that CMS is is going to look at your setting and and the evidence that we provide them. Um, so we just want to make sure that any providers that that need more technical assistance that we can get to you first to provide you that technical assistance and and maybe even more often maybe even an extra visit if, if the health plans can afford it um, given that they have to visit every setting but we are we're going to do our very best to make sure that you are able to come into compliance and your help is needed and to make sure that you get that technical assistance that you need So heightened scrutiny um, is a process that CMS developed for settings that they have are presumed to have the qualities of an institution. So um, some of the prongs for those qualities of an institution is any setting located in a building that is also a publicly or privately operated facility that provides inpatient institutional treatment, any setting that's located in a building on the grounds of or immediately adjacent to a public institution, and any other set, uh, setting that has the effect of isolating individuals receiving Medicaid from the barter community. So those first two prongs are really black and white, easy to figure out. Doesn't mean, again, that you cannot be an HCBS provider. It just means that we have to go through this additional heightened scrutiny process to show CMS that you can become compliant with the HCBS rules or that you already are. And then um, this third prong is a little bit more of a gray area. So we've um, tried to figure out through the provider um, self-assessments and some other tools what might be a flag for those effects of isolation. Um, you know, again, just being completely honest when you do complete that self-assessment or you do complete that um, short survey we'll be sending out soon is in your best interest. We want to make sure that everyone's compliant. We don't want to lose providers. And if we have to go through this heightened scrutiny process, it's not really a scary thing. We're already going to have a lot of the evidence that we need for CMS from that annual monitoring process that you're already taking part in. So the whole heightened scrutiny process is, was created to make sure that we can preserve those settings that are initially presumed to have those institutional qualities and presumed to not be compliant with the HCBS rules. So through the heightened screening process, the state meaning access is going to assert that the setting complies with the HCBS rules, um, including working on a remediation plan to come into compliance. And we're going to submit a packet of evidence to CMS to prove this. CMS, um, can make the ultimate determination whether or not the evidence supports the setting and whether or not you can become compliant in the transition period. So part of the process through for heightened scrutiny is that we'll notify, obviously, you, the provider, and the members um, that attend the setting. We'll prepare that evidentiary packet for public comment, and that evidentiary packet is going to consist of all the annual um, monitoring tools. Um, we're also going to implement a public comment period and modify the evidentiary packet if we need to uh, for some of the comments received. And ultimately, we'll submit that whole evidentiary packet to CMS to prove that um, those providers can come into compliance with the HCBS rules. Um, and again, that evidentiary packet is the annual assessment tool. So it's going to be the provider self-assessment any copies of procedures and policies that you can uh, provide that will support um, that you are integrated in your community, um, descriptions of processes that take place um, that enhance or improve member integration, examples of how your schedules are varied according to member preferences, procedures to routinely monitor individual access to services in the broader community, and descriptions of how staff are trained and, and monitored on their understanding of um, person-centered planning. Um, the evidentiary packet will also include a narrative summary, which is the qualities of the setting and how it's integrated in and supports full access uh, to those members receiving services into the greater community. Um, any remediation strategies that, uh, which is the technical assistance that the health plan provides to uh, make sure that you can become compliant with the HCBS rules. Um, it could include um, 
the caps that the health plan um, might issue to be, make sure that you can come into compliance, and then a summary of any uh, public comments that we've received during that process. So do you think it's important, Danielle, that we highlight that after we get all the documentation, we do have to um, provide public notice that this setting has been um, considered to be a candidate for heightened scrutiny, and that gives everybody an opportunity to review the documentation and weigh in on what you all think as a community, um, and then that we make adjustments to documentation based upon that or incorporate the feedback from the community. So CMS has an understanding of how the community feels. And there's certainly privacy issues related to posting that documentation, and so we're consulting with our internal privacy officer about how we share that information in a generic way so as not to um, identify or to ensure protection of healthcare information. So um, as, as part of the, the, this whole HCBS rules process, CMS um, requires that we have a plan for relocation if a setting is um, deemed that it cannot come into compliance with the HCBS rules. Um, this isn't something that we see happening, but we had to have a plan in place. So this is our plan. We'd have to make those relocation decisions by June of 2021 to make sure that members are in compliance settings by March of 2022. Um, just a reminder, not something we think we'll have to use, just the plan, um, just in case. So a little bit about other setting types. Um, Danielle, if you could advance the screen. Thank you. So um, in addition to those settings that Danielle highlighted before, um, both residential and non-residential, we have to look at settings that mimic those licensed settings. Um, and we need to ensure that those meet HDBS rules compliance. And so this has been part of our stakeholder engagement over the years. Um, but there are settings called intentional communities. And so characteristics of these settings are privately funded and operated residential complexes to support members both residentially and with non-residential services. We consider these settings to be provider owned and controlled. And so we do need to assess for compliance with the HCBS rules. Excuse me. So given, depending upon what setting um, it is, likely we would use the group home uh, residential um, tool to assess those settings. And so partly what we need the community to do is help us identify um, those settings that are out there. We know of a few, um, but we'll need to work with the community to identify other settings. So um, the uh, regarding individualized living arrangements, these are primarily a DDD uh, kind of residential setting. So these are homes or apartments that are owned or leased by members who live alone or with other roommates also receiving Medicaid funded habilitation services. So the members jointly choose the staff and the agency to be the provider of their services. Um, if the setting um, does have a financial affiliation with an organization or operational function, such as 24 hour staffing, this would be considered a provider owned and controlled setting. So again, not a licensed group home, but functions um, every day like a group home and so we would need to assess compliance that has characteristics of being provider owned and controlled. Again, there's also going to be settings that we haven't yet identified. So um, these would be setting types that we haven't mentioned here today um, or site specific settings that people feel like in the community that may be out of compliance with the HCBS rules. So we're working on a process where information can be submitted to our access clinical resolution team by anyone, their phone, email, or filling out a form on the web. And then in receipt, in receipt of that information, and we'll include this in materials and outreach materials, we'll work in partnership with the health plans, with the managed care organizations to research further and elect um, uh, to perform an assessment and determine compliance for the setting if we feel like that's applicable. So a little bit about um, provider support. So we're, I think we're going to turn it over to Bill, Bill Kennard, our Workforce Development Administrator here at Access, to talk about what support is forthcoming for you all in the next few months. Well, good afternoon. Um, one, we want to talk just a little bit about kind of a, uh, a four-part orientation, training, and education 
um, system, if you will, of uh, kind of a virtual conference, using a virtual conference model um, available to you um, beginning today and extending through May. So these uh, conferences will be used uh, or accessed through Zoom and uh, they consist of, as we say, four parts. So today, the HCBS overview in two weeks on February the 13th, uh, a self-assessment training uh, on the self-assessment tools. Beginning in March and April, some setting specific workshops that talk about the kind of implementation of the rules in preparation for that assessment process. And then the fourth part is kind of a, a once the audits begin in earnest, kind of a quarterly or as needed sessions where uh, results from the audits would be shared with the uh, with the field and kind of some technical assistance uh, grant given. So I'm going to go through um, those uh, these uh, upcoming events and uh, we'll just kind of describe them quickly here for you. So in two weeks on February the 13th from one to three via Zoom, uh, there will be a training in the self-assessment tool. Kind of a, the purpose is really two parts. One is to orient you to the self-assessment tools. And these uh, tools are setting relevant. So there's not just one master tool, but rather um, tools that have been developed and adapted to the particular types of settings that are involved in the, uh, the HCBS rules implementation project. And then kind of the second part is kind of the instruction on the use of the tool. So kind of going through the items, trying to understand them and how they're used. And again, that uh, will be on the 13th, so two weeks from now and on one to three, and you'll register um, via Zoom uh, as you did uh, for this session. The third section is kind of setting specific workshops. And the, the purpose of these workshops is really to give some rules, uh, some examples of the rules implementation. So you, you might be um, you know, a, a provider of a day program service, and as you go through the self-assessment and you go through the rules, you might say, oh, how am I going to do that um, in my setting? <clears throat> so the idea on these setting-specific workshops is to have uh, your peers, basically, uh, to present different models, different examples, different efforts that are undergoing or uh, underway that basically kind of present an image of what that, uh, what those implementation of those rules might look like. And it's also just to provide not only the information, but some inspiration as well. So, the uh, this, the setting specific workshops will consist of four workshop tracks. So each track has a specific type of setting in, in mind. So DD residential, EPD assisted living, DD and EPD day programs, and DD employment. Within each of those tracks, the workshops, the actual sessions will be organized by some themes that are really um, a part of the, uh, the HCBS rules. So for example, uh, one theme would be member experiences in community life. And there would be, let's say, four workshops within uh, that, that theme, each of those workshops organized and dedicated to the particular uh, track. So there would be a workshop in DD residential around member experience and community life, uh, a workshop around EPD assisted living and member experience community life, et cetera. This would be kind of replicated by those, again, those four, these rule themes. So member experience, personal choices, individualizing practices, and integrating settings. The staff, if you will, or the presenters, just as a, is in a conference, because this is the part of the conference that usually most of us like to go to, um, would be uh, uh, organized uh, and really presented 
by your colleagues, other providers who have or are working uh, to implement the rules and have some uh, inf inspirational as well as informative uh, examples to share um, with uh, their colleagues. So these provider panels will actually be the kind of the presentation staff, if you will, during the course of these spe uh, setting specific workshops. The content for those workshops is being developed right now, so maybe some of you um, have been contacted by the Workforce Development Administrator of the various health plans who are assisting us with this process, and uh, hopefully you agreed to volunteer to help us construct what those workshops might be. And if you have, actually or maybe considering being a part of that panel as well. These will, these setting specific workshops will be beginning in March and April. The second kind of part of the, per, of the, uh, of the setting specific workshops is the person-centered planning workshop. Um, it will be kind of a, beginning in May, and it will be kind of a, a one kind of size fits all workshop um, in the in the person-centered planning process. So that's being developed as uh, as we speak right now as well. And finally, the fourth part is kind of the audit results and TA sessions. And the purpose really again of that of those sessions are to share learnings both the positive learnings as well as some problematic things. So the process would be that audits are conducted, are conducted, uh, the findings are described, we would share those learnings, you know, kind of organize the themes and offer assistance during those courses, those TA sessions and things. So those four areas, so starting today with the overview, followed up in two weeks um, by the self-assessment training, then beginning in March and April, there's more setting specific um, workshops that are geared towards the rules and the implementation of those rules uh, that are relevant to this type of setting that you um, provide services in. And last but not least, these audit results TA sessions that would begin um, sometime after the, uh, the audit results begin. So we, um, we're, we really appreciate your involvement in this. Uh, again, there these workshops are all online. You will register for them. Uh, they'll be conducted over Zoom. We're also recording these as we are recording today's uh, session so that if you can't tune in to one of those uh, part three workshops, you can download it and uh, review it uh, at your leisure off of the website. Okay. Danielle, Kara? Great. So looking at the other sort of provider support opportunity, we mentioned earlier that um, there we don't have an influx of resources, of financial resources that are coming um, as a result of our requirements around um, the compliance with the HCBS rules. But what we are offering um, is a con right now it's a consideration. It hasn't been finalized yet, but we did do a request for information for something called a differential adjusted payment. That closed at the end of December. Um, current considerations for the HCBS rules are that um, to consider differential adjusted payment for providers who participate in training and also complete the self-assessment pre-screening survey. So not the self-assessment that's part of the quality monitoring visit, but the separate survey that Danielle talked about, which will help give us an assessment of kind of where you are. Um, currently to help prioritize technical assistance. Um, so that public notice is going to go out the end of this month. Um, we'd encourage you to look for that and to provide feedback. But if that, um, if we ultimately approve that approach, then qualifying providers would be identified by May 1st. Um, so we would identify for our folks in rates and reimbursement that these providers have met whatever requirements we have outlined for the differential adjusted payment. And for those providers who have met that criteria, such so as what we just talked about around participating in training and completing the pre-screening survey, they would get an increased rate percentage applied to 
um, the current rate for services that you received today for the period of 10-1-20 through 9-30-21. So again, this is all still um, pre-planned, um, but we want to um, ensure that you are aware of this in full transparency so you could be participating now and potentially be a candidate for that um, percentage rate increase uh, for the differential adjusted payment. So that wraps up our session today. Thank you uh, for taking the time to listen. Um, uh, we will have more information on our website. Please sign up for our constant contact email list to stay informed about the website updates and anything else going on with HGBS um, rules. The website is www.azahccs.gov slash HCBS. Thank you so much for your time today. Thank you.